Well, good morning. You know, due to our structure, uh, it's rare that a COS pastor is able to give a sermon on back-to-back Sundays. I, I love what one person said some time ago, uh, it's been years ago now, when we were starting Community the Savior as a church plant, and this person looked at our structure and noticed that different people and different backgrounds and perspectives were preaching most every Sunday on some kind of a rotating basis. And that person said, you know, church at COS isn't like white bread. It's got texture. And so that's a part of our, you know, that you get a different voice on a regular basis. You get a different perspective and a different set of backgrounds. But today, you're stuck with me one more time. It's one of those rare opportunities where, where we do have a chance to speak back to back. And it's kind of good in some ways to do that because you can develop a theme and carry it on. So every now and then there's a necessary change in schedule and I'm blessed on, on this Sunday to sort of have a chance to a little bit give something of a part two to last week's message. Last week, if you happen to have been here and worshiping at COS, you know that I tried to share on the theme from the Old Testament and the Gospel reading, and I, sub, and I titled it, Of Golden Calves and Wedding Garments, Keeping Faith in an Inscrutable God. This morning's Exodus passage in Exodus chapter 33 gives us a glimpse of the rest of the story. If I were to give a title for this morning, it would be not, not of golden calves and wedding garments, but in the cleft of the rock. And not keeping faith in an inscrutable God, but, but growing faith in an inscrutable God. In the cleft of the rock, growing faith in an inscrutable God. The, the, you've noticed in what I would have dubbed the title, that is, that the inscrutability of God hasn't changed. But here in Exodus chapter 33, in, in watching and noticing and listening to Moses relate to God and intercede for the people, we find something of a, of a model for both growing faith as well as a guide to meaningful and effective prayer. And by the way, meaningful and effective prayer is really synonymous with the spiritual life. It's really synonymous with growing faith because prayer is more than simply the words that come out of our mouths or out of our hearts or our minds. Prayer is the, is the being of our lives in the presence of God. Our lives themselves are acts of prayer. And so Exodus 33, as you've heard it read this morning, opens against the backdrop of a crisis a crisis in the lives of God's people. That golden calf incident was was a bit of of a crescendo or a breaking point in a string of struggling faith, struggles of faith in the lives of God's people. They were struggling in the wilderness. You remember the story if you have read these narratives before. It's a story of grumbling and complaining and rebelling along the way. It's a story of begging God to do something, and God does. He gives manna and quail, and then they, and then they try to hoard that, and there's all kinds of difficulties. There's a story of, of how are you going to provide for us, of, us God? And it's the story of water from the rock and so many different things up to this point. And then we get to this climactic breaking point with the golden calf story that we saw last week. And all trust is sort of blown apart in a crisis of relationship. Things have gotten so bad, God, so difficult that I don't believe I can trust you anymore. What does it mean to keep faith in an inscrutable God was the wrestling point for them. All trust was now given up in a crisis of relationship, in a, in a lust for easy answers, in a refusal to live with mystery. And you know, though the circumstances of our lives today might be different and undoubtedly are, we too find ourselves, perhaps today, perhaps some, at some point in our lives or perhaps in the future in crises of faith. 
where we find it difficult to not only keep faith, but, but to grow in faith in God. And it's against that backdrop. It's against that backdrop that we see Moses here today. Moses is, is bold. Moses is relentless. Moses is trusting. Moses is ready to risk everything on the possibility of an actual growing, living relationship with this inscrutable God. I personally find the characteristics of Moses in this story so, so very helpful in the various crises that we have faced in these days, and I know that some of you have faced. I was just going through in my mind the last five years, and I thought, oh my, somebody needs to throw me off the boat. <laughs> I'm Moses. In 2015, I had a heart attack. In 2017, our house burned in fire. In 2020, <laughs> we have this death of our dear daughter-in-law. Maybe you shouldn't sit next to me. Maybe the six feet is not even close enough. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes you feel like that, right? But I know that, that our lives have only scratched the surface of what so many of you and so many people in our globe have experienced, not only for a five-year window, but for a long time. There are crises of faith. We not only need to keep faith with God, we need to find a way to actually grow in faith in an inscrutable God. Both are critically important. And so here we come today, and these, what I see in Moses today is personally helpful. And because it's helpful for me, I believe by faith that it may be helpful for others as well. And I want to share these with you very briefly with the prayer that they may also be helpful to you. The first thing that I noticed here about Moses is that Moses was immersed in the Word of God. In, in coming to God, Moses was immersed in the Word of God. He comes to God in chapter 33 against that backdrop, and he says, God, you have said. And again, he says, God, you have said. Twice in one verse, he says, you have said, bring this people up, and you have said, I know you by name. Notice that Moses' prayer Moses' intercession doesn't start with his own words. It doesn't start with his thoughts or his ideas. It starts with what he believes he's heard from God. Moses is immersed in the word of God. His prayer starts with the very words of God. There's a there's perhaps something we can learn there. That to be so deeply immersed in the word of God that our prayer life actually flows from those words that God has said. That a relationship with God flows from the things that God has said about God's self and our relationship. That my, my relationship to God, my life of prayer, the vibrancy of my faith is directly tied to my immersion in the voice of God, in the word of God, in my care, careful listening to what God has said and in my internalizing of God's claims upon the world and upon my life. Moses is immersed in the word of God. We could almost stop there. But secondly, Moses is transparent with his expectations of God, and in fact, even insistent. Moses doesn't hold back. As I said earlier, he's bold, he's courageous, he pushes out there. He, on the basis of what God has said, Moses moves to the next step. He says, let me know whom you will send with me. If you've said, I'm going to bring you up, then let me know who you will send with me. Show me your ways, he says here in Exodus 33. He says, consider that this nation is your people. But note that Moses' expectations are not, are not wild and fanciful expe expectations of God. Rather, they're thoughtful expressions of the implications of what God has said. 
God, if you said this, then it's got to play out in my life in real and tangible ways. It's about the fulfillment of the very words of God in his life, and so he asks for for more insight into God's direction. He asks for more understanding of God's direction and influence for himself and for the people. Moses is transparent with his expectations of God. And and then notice that in Exodus 33, Moses is honest, (laughs) ruthlessly honest with his need of God. Verses 14 through 16 of, of Exodus 33, if you happen to have a Bible or want to look at it later today, Exodus 33, 14 through 16 are the pivotal fulcrum of this passage. God promises in verse 14 everything that Moses has asked to this point. He says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. That, that little word, my presence will go with you is a word you know, even if you're not sure that you know it. It's Hebrew. It's Imanu, from which we get Emmanuel. With you. God says in verse 14, I'm going to give you everything that you're asking for. And then Moses is bold enough and honest enough about his need to press in on God's promise of presence a bit more. In a, in a selfless, courageous plea, Moses changes the pronouns from singular to plural. God has said, I'm going to be with you, Moses. And Moses is bold enough to say, well, thank you, but, but we, we, we need more. We need you to be with us. Moses changes this pronoun from singular to plural and says to God that your presence must be with us. By the way, the sign of a true leader. The sign of a true leader is one who always thinks of the well-being of the people before she or he thinks of oneself. And that's Moses here. And then Moses knows something and expresses something that is at the very core of the life of faith. And it's this. He says this. Unless you go with us, in this way we shall be distinct and I and your people from every people on the face of the earth. Do you see what's there? that the only real distinctiveness of God's people is the presence of God in their lives. The only distinctiveness of the people of God is the presence of God in their lives. That's it. That's, That's all. That's everything. The struggles are the same between the people of God and those who are not people of God. The gifts of creation are the same for those who are people of God and those who are not people of God. The only distinction, the only thing that distinguishes God's people is the quality and characteristic of God's presence in their lives, regardless of the circumstances. Without the presence of God in our lives, we are not the people of God. Moses is immersed in God's word. Moses is transparent with his expectation. He's honest with his need of God. And then finally, Moses is content, even even protected in the hiddenness of God. Moses is content, even protected in the hiddenness of God. Moses, having, having heard God's promise of God's presence with them, Moses is bold to press God even further and says, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see the awesome shrouded mystery. I want to see and, and experience the essence of your divine being, all that it means at the core being for you to be God. 
What a beautiful yearning. <laughs> it's sort of bubbling out of Moses to, to know more and more of God. And God responds in a very gracious but guarded way, an honest way. God responds by saying, I, I will show you all of my glory that you're able to bear. I will make my goodness pass before you. My will, my desire is to be gracious and generous. I will show mercy. I will let you see in this lifetime, Moses, everything about me that you're able to bear. But, but Moses, I cannot show you my full glory. I can't show you my full glory because if you saw all that it means to be God, you would be blown away. <laughs> you would be disintegrated in the presence of the holy and the majestic and the wonderful and the powerful. Instead, instead, Moses, I will protect you. I will protect you as you cultivate a vibrant living relationship with me. I will absolutely bring you as close as possible. But I will always hold you. I will always keep you in a place of safety in the, in the cleft of the rock. With, and I will cover you there with my hand so that you are protected. Dear friends, I pray today that you sense and know yourself to be in the cleft of the rock, yearning to know more and more about the glory of God, to come as close to God as you possibly can in this present existence, knowing that, that even though now we see dimly as only through a mirror, one day, one day we will see face to face and for eternity we will be transformed from glory to glory in the very presence of the inscrutable God. That's God's desire for you and me. That's God's invitation for your life, for my life. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen.